So, um, yes, the first thing, uh, this is your third, fourth, fifth sixth. visit, sixth visit sixth. to Israel. So yep. what the hell is someone born from Sri Lanka, uh -huh. Australian citizenship, lives in San Francisco, okay. no real Jewish relationship? It's the hummus. I keep coming back to the hummus. Um, no, I, I came here like in 2010 for the first time, um, actually because I had read uh, Startup Nation. And so I was like, I was doing a world trip and I was like, I need to come and see what's going on here. And one of the first people I met was Eden, um, who introduced me to the startup scene here. And I was kind of just really taken away because it's one of the few countries where you have such a talented group of people in such a small area and everyone knows everyone else. So I met Eden and from there, I think I've met pretty much every other person in the startup scene here. So it's incredible. Uh, so Mithril, right? That's your latest endeavor um, after being software engineer and being, being productive, being, moving over to the dark side. And being pretty useless for a couple of years. So, um, yeah, so Mithril is uh, Peter Thiel's growth stage fund. Um, we're about $500 million investing in um, long-term companies. So, for example, our first investment was in Palantir Technologies. We believe in platforms. We believe in investing for the long run. We believe in being patient. Um, so I think one of the problems with a lot of VCs is looking at um, short-term gains with exits or even IPOs. And we believe that there are, once companies go, uh, like are forced into these things, they make the wrong choices. So when a company goes public, they start thinking about quarterly goals versus long-term investments in their technology. So if you look at the various things we're doing, uh, so Palantir is one example in cyber. Our third investment was actually Endgame Systems, which is another platform company in the cyberspace. Um, so we're big believers in cyber and um, platform companies. So uh, you've, you've looked at many, many Israeli companies, and you also um, kind of was an ambassador for Israeli companies in the Valley. What's, what's your perception, or what's, actually, what's the perception from the outside in, right? So the Valley, people thinking about Israel and thinking about Israeli cyber and other startup companies, what, what kind of perception is there? Okay, I think Israel has an interesting, uh, like there's a double perception. One is everyone believes Israel produces really interesting technology companies. But at the same time, the thing is it produces, as Joe mentioned, it produces a lot of technology companies. So the problem is you have like a bunch of companies doing the exact same thing with good technology, but once again, technology doesn't win. You need to actually know who your customer, customers are, et cetera. And plus it's look, looking at your targets. Like um, if you want to work in enterprise, you kind of have to really know the enterprise space. And we find that a lot of people, Israeli companies coming out to the US kind of go in blind at not knowing what to do. So you get technology right, you don't necessarily get the business side right all the time, but the great thing is you have a new generation of entrepreneurs coming up who are learning to spe like bridge the gap between the two. So if you need to take even specific lessons, just without naming the company, it's just kind of positive versus negative kind of approaches for when companies were traveling the valley. Um, the, let's start with the positives. Uh, the positives are usually you have some really high order thinking, different thinking about the way to solve technical challenges. The negatives would be sometimes in meetings, they have no idea what they're really saying. Like they'll just push and push on technology, um, like Joe said, and not actually say, like know who their customer is. Because you're seeing certain cases where people are like, well, our target is SMBs. Actually, SMBs are horrible people to be customers. They're unsophisticated. It's really hard to get a market going with them. Enterprises seem really attractive, but half the time to get into an enterprise, you have to have a strategy. And what's one of the key things, especially if, if we look at cyber as one side, is it's, cyber is really about risk management. And a lot of people don't think of those ways. People think in terms of just particular solutions, and I call those bullets. So I've seen like 20 different APT defense companies. And honestly, like the market can't support all of them, and there's very few ones that it will support. So I think people need to rethink about how they look at this market a little bit. Yeah, you, you, you kind of mentioned platforms versus bullets uh, a lot. I think there was also in um, some disservice uh, to the industry by talking about um, threats, right, versus maybe a company like Palantir, which is actually a BI platform, right? So it's supposedly people wouldn't immediately correlate that with cyber. Yeah. But, so. but that's, that's one of the great things is if you're building a platform company, you have a way to diversify in multiple areas. So Palantir works really well in the, the government space, but also in finance, and there are probably n number of different areas it can go into. Now, the most interesting cyber companies are the ones that take that model and say, well, we can build really interesting um, like infrastructure 
we can target cyber or target security risk management first, but also branch out into other spaces. Because in the end, like, if you really think about it, the most valuable companies build these really strong ecosystems around them because they can, go, they can branch out. So if you're solving one particular problem in a, let, let's just say, like we call bullets. So if you're doing purely APT defense, where do you go from there? Um, versus saying, well, we do um, APT defense, but also our platform works on quantifying all kinds of different anomalies you know, within your environment. So I think it's looking beyond one solution and saying, look, look let's become a bit more broad-based. What's your thought about uh, offensive versus defensive companies? There has been a lot of people coming out of Israel with offensive kind of technologies. Um, yeah, I would say, my personal opinion is, if you're doing offensive technology, stay away from, from it. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a really gray area where um, there's two types of markets. The consulting market doing O-Days, it exists, people do it, it's easy money. Um, it's very hard to transition from doing O-Days and going into becoming legitimate again. It's like being in porn. You, you, know, you start in porn, you're never going to go legit. Um, so I would say um, if you're going to do offensive systems, there's a very narrow band. And honestly, the market is not as big as everyone thinks it is because your clients are very narrow and it, the ones that will pay a lot of money beyond the government aren't the ones you want to be, the want to have as clients. Yeah, no yeah. comment. <laughs> uh, so it, funding has always been um, an issue, right, for many companies, many of the startup companies. If you look at seed stage companies um, and there has been a trend of Israelis just jumping uh, onto a, you know, El Al, El Y, zero, zero, one, and saying, hey, you know, I'll take over the world if, after a week worth of meetings in, in the Valley. What's, what kind of, what works and what doesn't work, and are there new programs that would make sense for these companies? Sure. I, I think the first thing, if you're a new company, get on AngelList. That's probably the best way to kind of kickstart things. One, it doesn't mean you'll find your immediate set of angels, but it gets you visibility. Um, a lot of people have had really good traction. Two, I think, is really get to know, like, one of the things I think can work better here is people helping each other out with who are the right people to talk to in the Valley. Like, everyone in the Valley will meet you, but not everyone's going to be useful to you. So I think there's only, like, a couple of people that I would consider the best connectors who will genuinely help you out, and everyone else is just curious to meet someone from Israel. So I think from that perspective, get to know the right sets of people. Um, Angelus is a good portion, and, like, there's tons of opportunity. Like, I would say... Um, if you're, if you're a couple of entrepreneurs that are not really that confident, um, programs like Upwest Labs are pretty, have done pretty well. Um, there was a recent cybersecurity company that was part of their, um, their batch doing APT defense. Uh, but, uh, and they were, a bunch of VCs were fighting over them. So there's a, lot, there's a huge market in America for these technologies, but a lot of people just need the kind of um, training to deal with people and customers, et cetera. So I think there are tons of different types of paths you can go down, but I think it really depends on connecting with the right people who can help your business or how you want, you know, and be open to a lot of different advice. Some of it's not going to be very nice. Yeah, just wondering, in QTEL, right, mm -hmm. that's uh, CIA's investment arm, do they invest also in Israeli companies? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I would say that uh, you, it's possible through a proxy, um, eventually an Israeli company becoming an American company, um, but I don't think directly. It's not their mandate. <laughs> in general, so what's going back to the perception question, right? So what's, if you look at the perception of Israeli companies, are they at the disadvantage uh, because of their Israeli heritage? Um, and if so, any ideas on how to deal with that? Or have you seen success in dealing with that? Um, I think the only space that could be a problem, as Joe mentioned, is in the government itself. I think in the valley um, itself, Israeli companies have uh, a, pretty, a pretty decent... Um, like, uh, uh, people are very open to it, but there's also a sense of very old school Israeli startups that uh, were hard to deal with. So there's a lot of, uh, there's, so, there's some historical baggage which people still have, which is why I encourage a lot of the young entrepreneurs to go out there and meet, the, meet, um, meet investors in the Bay Area and like get them to rethink what it is to be an Israeli startup. So I think I'm seeing the mark of a fan of time. Okay. Um, what are your top three companies in Israel right now, favorite? Okay, so this, is, this will be controversial. Uh, I should mention what I'm invested in, but I won't. Um, <laughs> um, I really like the guys from Cybera. Um, they are doing APT defense, but they're really top entrepreneurs. They're, in fact, if any of you get a, guys get a chance, you should meet them just because they're really good guys and they're doing the right things. They're the, one of the few Israeli companies I've met where the founders haven't trash talked about other founders. 
So. <laughs> Um, that's a positive. Yeah. So, so that, so that's one, um, number one. Um, I really, this is not cyber. I really like Sibo, uh, which is a toys company. Uh, but the the founders are really stellar. They come from uh, you know a pretty good unit. Um, but they're doing something very different. Taking saying, look, we're very smart, but we want to build toys for kids, which are really smart. Which I think, if anyone has kids, you should get their toys. Yeah. Um, uh, number three, I just. I'll pull up a lot. I'm going to do three companies. They're all in the same space, but I, I like them all. So uh, I'm an investor in Zimperium. Um, they're very good. Skycure is also a great uh, mobile phone security company and Lacoon Security. I think they're all really strong founders. They're all doing good things. And I want, what I really like is they will all compete in different, they all have different approaches to the same thing, but they're all going to do pretty well. Uh, yeah. Thank you.